Hello, welcome to the program, Woke Up. And one of the things that's just absolutely strange to me is this concept of uh, men giving birth. And when we look at the demographics in America, there's about 3 million births a year. And maybe 1% of the population self-identifies as uh, trans. And out of those, most of the females to males, uh, they uh, don't give birth because they're on testosterone. And it's a big warning to not give birth if you're on testosterone. And so we're clear, men are not giving birth, uh, biological men are not giving birth. It's, it's, uh, it's biological females that in their mind, they have a, a gender dysphoria or they self-identify as male. And then they decide because it's natural for a female to give forth birth uh, to get off testosterone. And so out of the 1% that are trans, very few of those would even give birth. And so we're talking maybe several hundred a year in America. And so the entire birthing system has been thrown up and up in the air. And so we have uh, on the show today, a woman who's extremely uh, in, attuned to what has been going on uh, in the birthing world. Uh, her name is Isabella Malvin. She has an amazing podcast. It's called Whose Body Is It? She has uh, very intelligent guests and she has dedicated herself uh, uh, to help and empower women. women. Uh, she's a doula. Uh, she was trained in the, uh, in the organization Radical Birth Keeper. She's a hypnotist and she's a life coach and works hard for the sovereignty of women. Uh, one of the things about Isabella is she is a former leftist and now a radical truth teller. And so Isabella, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for coming on. And why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and where you're coming from and, and what your, how your worldview has evolved. Thank you so much for having me. So yeah, as you mentioned, I, I, I started off actually as a doula. I wouldn't consider myself a doula now. Um, as I radicalized in a couple different ways, uh, uh, I walked away from supporting women in the industrial birth system, in the medical industrial complex. Uh, and my most recent work uh, supporting women in a birthing capacity um, has been entirely outside the system and more of a, a lay midwifery um, capacity. So along with waking up to the trans ideology, I was also waking up to uh, the ways that women specifically are targeted within the medical industrial complex, um, whether that's um, pushing hormonal birth control uh, industrial birth, hysterectomy, um, and then of course uh, the targeting of women in under the guise of trans ideology and gender identity. So that whole realm of medicine, quote medicine. Um, so yeah, I I became a doula at an interesting time. It was 2016 that I did a doula training in New York. Uh, in Brooklyn, where I'm, I'm originally from New York City. And I was 24. And I, I say it was an interesting time because it was about a year after uh, a pretty, a pretty big turning point in the midwifery community. Um, so the language had been changed in a, in a very short period of time, in, in what Mary Lou Singleton calls like a coup, which she's referred to as a, a total coup. Um, and there had been a letter that she had written and co-authored uh, and had a bunch of midwives uh, sign protesting the removal of the words woman and mother from uh, midwifery core curriculum um, competency programs and, and, and whatnot. So, you know, women go to midwifery school, they go to midwifery colleges. Um, there's a board called MANA who kind of sets the terms for what midwives and doulas are going to say and how they're going to conduct um, care for women. And so they set the standards and they had been captured. And so Mary Lou authored this letter. She had a bunch of women sign it. This was about a year before my doula training. So 2016, I get to my doula training. And the first thing before we get to the hormonal. But just one thing too, I just want to add in that letter, there was like over 300 doulas or uh, people that are practicing that said, wait, wait, the, the direction of where you're going and this ideology you're implementing we're not in agreement. So it wasn't a bunch of people. It was over 300 from yes. Canada and, and the United States, which uh, they're saying, no, this is uh, taking on the mothership organization saying, no, this is uh, uh, disempowering. And, and, and so mm -hmm. go on. But I wanted to, I wanted mm -hmm. to just add that it was bigger than a, a, a big group of people. It was yeah. a significant part of the organization. 
Yes. Thank you for naming that. And also my recollection is still somewhat based on what I was told. Like when I retell the story, I'm part, you know, I'm, I can, I can see the parts that were untrue, but also a huge part of my recollection of this time is, um, you know, the story that was being fed to me was that it was a small group of older racist white midwives uh, and they had been really disappointed that uh, uh, who had you know come up on this list so they were not emphasizing uh, or revealing that there were over 300 people it was you know there's this group um so at that point yeah i had no idea how many women had signed the um the letter so yeah you know before we got into birth you know like hormones and like what is a c-section what is an episiotomy like, how does breastfeeding work? Like, what does a mother need when she's pregnant or, you know, giving birth or postpartum? None of that. The first lesson was, you know, we no longer use the words woman, uh, pregnant woman, we use the words birthing person, chest feeder, menstruating human, blah, blah, blah. And I just thought, okay, cool. Like, this is cool. I'm learning something new. You know, I had a neoliberal education. I went to an elite conservatory for art um all the kind of the 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 ground had been laid for me in terms of uh being readily uh able to accept what they were telling and also I was in a position of like student like there was a dynamic here of like authority like they are the experts and I am the student here to learn like I'm I'm ready to just absorb um I'm also, you know, consider myself to be like kind. I had history working with mothers and babies. You know, I was uh, already, you know, intimately working in, in, in people's homes, uh, developing close relationships with mothers of small children. Um, yeah. So I, I just at that point, I couldn't think of any reason why this would be bad. I actually even felt a bit um, excited to know this thing that I could then tell other people about like did you know that not all people who give birth are women like it's kind of like a it's like a it's a trick right it's like a it's like a it's a it's almost like um you know you you get a I remember getting a, a sense of satisfaction from just like knowing something that others didn't like being on the precipice of some kind of new um movement I guess you could say uh yeah and then yeah, so so I, I remember that. And then for three years, I yeah, I didn't use the words woman and mother in my vocabulary. I taught dozens of couples childbirth education. At that point, I attended, you know, a couple dozen births, um, both in hospital, at home, at birthing centers. And not once did I have a client who believed that they were stuck in the wrong body. I, not once did I have a client who had had a double mastectomy had been on testosterone. I mean, no one that I was serving even fit that profile. Um, and what's also interesting is that we didn't have a training that was like sensitive to working with women with like severe mental health issues. And I feel like there could be a case made for how do you, like if asked to serve a woman who has cut off her breast and taking testosterone for five years and who believes that she is stuck in the wrong body. Like, I believe that it might be, there is some value to having a training around how to work with a woman like that, with those issues. But that training would never, I would never (laughs) expect that training to uh, affirm that everything she's saying is true, that she actually is a pregnant man. So, yes. So uh, you said you never encountered a person like this. It would be an interesting uh, study out of the 300 women that signed this document. How many of them actually encountered uh, a biological female that self-identified as a man that's now saying a man is giving birth, maybe a handful. And out of that, like, for instance, when, so we're clear when we say chest feeding uh, instead of breastfeeding, which is the language of our culture since, uh, the country was founded. Uh, just, just so I'm clear, ma- males, biological males, are not ch- uh, breastfeeding. These are uh, biological females that breastfeed, but self, but self-identify as male, and therefore we dumb that down and change the language to accommodate the one out of five thousand births to throw a number out there. Is that am I correct in what I'm what I'm understanding, or, or am I missing something? 
Yes, the, the chest feeding term applies to anyone like producing milk essentially from their breast. So this could apply to a mother who has her breasts, who breastfeeds, you know, they, she would be called the chest feeder. Um, and also a woman who believes she's stuck in the wrong body, who identifies quote with quotes, identifies as male, who's had a double mastectomy, who may still have some remaining breast tissue that can mm -hmm. produce like a very, very small amount of breast milk. Um, she might, you know, that, that term would be applied to her as well. And then by extension, um, you know, we've seen these stories of men who uh, take synthetic hormones and drugs to produce very small amounts of milk from their mammary glands. And not enough to sustain the development no. of an infant. Absolutely not. Not even close. Not, not even close. Mm -hmm. But, you know, what's interesting about that is there's a, already a lot of misinformation or like abstraction around pregnancy, birth, and breastfeeding. And so unless you've watched a baby be breastfed, you know, over the course of years or are a breastfeeding counselor or have any knowledge about, you know, the quantity of, of milk that, you know, an infant needs, um, it's easy to just see that headline and be like, oh, well, they said that he breastfed, so he breastfed, right? It's not specific. They're, they're never revealing like, yes, he was only able to get like one ounce of breast milk over the course of four days. You know, like they're, they're, it's, it's so abstract. And I, I find this to be true also with the all the before and after photos that we see or sometimes just the after photos. Um, and they're intriguing. You know, that headline is intriguing. Seeing uh, a woman with no breasts, with a beard and a, and a big pregnant belly uh, is intriguing. It's confusing and it's intriguing. And, and as humans, like it is normal to want to look, to be curious um, because it's a total distortion, like of our humanity, um, mm -hmm. you know, our, our first, you know, our, our just a, a basic instinct is to be able to tell, okay, well, what is an object? What is an inanimate object? And then what is like a living being? Okay, what is an animal versus uh, a human? Um, uh, and then who is male and who is female? Like, these are just basic human instincts that we have. And so once that starts to feel confusing, or like, we, we, we can't identify readily, not to say that we can't eventually understand, oh, wait, no, that's not a person or, oh, no, that's not a man. But um, not being able to readily access that instinct is what we're seeing like across the board here. And um, I remember having a conversation with uh, a woman I went to college with. Uh, this was as I was starting to peak, like just starting to realize this was all just like totally nuts and I had been like brainwashed. And I remember saying to her, like, you know, my doula train told me that men can give birth. And she goes, I remember her hesitating and saying something along the lines of, well, they can't, but can they? A college educated, you know, 26, 27 year old woman. Like, uh, I mean, I was just in, in, in shock. And I remember having these conversations repeatedly where then I would confront friends and be like, you know, you know, that sex is dimorphic, right? Like, you, you know, that men can't become women and women can't become men. Right. And, and again, like some of my friends with master's degrees, some of them were the Victorians of my school, you know, just, just saying, you know, well, I'm, I'm not a biologist or, well, I actually don't know the scientific facts around what you're describing. So I don't know where I was going with that, but the, well, just the, the people that are highly intelligent, you think are very smart, uh, can't even answer a simple question when, all of humanity and uh, the 8 billion people on the planet and anywhere out, outside of this liberal echo chamber, primarily in urban centers, principally amongst white women, uh, if you go to any country in the world, they, they understand uh, the natural revelation of the difference between a male and a female and who can and can't give birth. And the, yeah. just the confusion that sets in uh, due to this ideology. I, that's my takeaway. I don't, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but mm. that, you know, I think it's pretty clear what you're saying overall. Yeah. Yeah. The, I think I was trying to get to the instinct, you know, just like the instinct being so blurred that we're afraid to name what is right in front of us. So, you know, we're afraid to describe what's right in front of us. And I think this is a really difficult thing to do because the lexicon 
Um, it's hard to talk about transgender ideology without using their language. The, the la- when I say their, I mean the language of the ideology, words like trans, words like transition, uh, terms like uh, gender reassignment surgery, sex reassignment surgery, uh, became a man, became a woman, mm-hmm. right? It's none of these, none of, none of this is actual, like actually describing what's going on. Um, and it's like collecting, you know, the, the, the language is collecting uh, evidence for the impossible. Um, and it's, yeah, it's very difficult to talk about. And, you know, one of the things that I emphasize on my platform and the women that I, that I serve is, is getting practice at describing like, and it's, and it's awkward, right? It's awkward to be like, that's not a trans woman because there's no such thing. There are only men and women, some of whom have had surgeries, have been on wrong sex hormones, opposite sex hormones, who uh, have had their cheekbones shaved down. Some of the women have had their breasts removed, you know, again, like describing what we're seeing in front of us. I think that is what is being taken away from us as adults. And then obviously what's going on with, with children as well, which is even more insidious. Um, so, you know, I, w- I want to talk about that, uh, but I want, I want to just go back a little bit. Uh, I, I want to you, I want you to disclose like personally uh, why, when you were indoctrinated, how you viewed other people, the, the effects on your personality, uh, how, how you morphed and your attitude toward others. And then, you know, how the light went on, you know, mm-hmm. uh, and then other, I really want to get into this other, these other things that you're talking about, but mm-hmm. I want to talk mm-hmm. real personal on a personal level, whatever level you feel comfortable. Mm-hmm. Well, I definitely felt like I was on a mission and I still feel like I'm on a mission. You know, I, I can see that I am the same woman in a lot of ways, you know, from, you know, the, the beginning of that doula training. Um, but I was really, I I really felt committed to improving the lives of women and children. And so at that time, I thought that this was the way to do it. It was to educate women on the horrors of hospital birth and provide, Mm -hmm. you know, informed consent and to hold their hands while they were abused by their doctors and their, even their midwives. Um, And that if I could just educate enough that it would help, uh, women have better birthing experiences. And when I felt like defeated in that realm, I moved towards younger women, like reproductive um, health and, and hormonal birth control and like that realm. And that's where I really started to come up against um, some of the trans stuff. But I, 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 but on a, like, on a personal level, I felt, um, I guess in the shadow sense, it was like righteous and, ego driven to feel like I had the answer. Um, and that I, you know, if I could just educate enough that this would make a difference. And on some level, I am still very much committed to education just in a, in a different way. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was still more of a reformist at that time. Like I really thought I could get a lot done in those systems that I was critiquing. And it wasn't until I was able to kind of zoom out. And, you know, I will say like, I'm, I'm not a Marxist, but I, I do find the Marxist analysis when it comes to men and women somewhat helpful because of the distortion that we're in right now around, you know, women, like the class of women just being like very individualistic and being made up of lots of individuals. I think in the current crisis that we're in, it is helpful to see women as a class, to see that we have unique issues uh, like uh, the ability to become pregnant, the ability, uh, uh, the exploitation that we face um, in regards to being prostituted or used uh, as surrogates. Um, so I do find that, you know, that that zooming out that I eventually did, that was really helpful to see, wow, okay, I'm in this system, I have these beliefs, what am I actually doing here? Do I actually think this is possible to make change in, in this way? So yeah, so the shadow side was probably e- egotistical. Uh, there was a righteousness around um, getting to be in this like fucked up system uh, and being kind of more in a savior role for the mm. families that I was working with. Um, and I've moved way more into kind of a sovereignty, um, you know, a, a, a vantage point of like, you have the answers. Like you are the authority on your birth. Um I can guide, I can advise, I can love, I can support, but ultimately I don't see myself as an authority over 
uh, anyone's birth. Um, now that gets a little murky when we're talking about, you know, choice. And I, I guess I used to think that women were making a lot more choices. Um, and what I've come to find is that there's so much propaganda and we are targeted so heavily based on our physiology that I don't think we're making uh, very many choices in the realm of uh, uh, what we think is like reproductive choice and the, you know, the, the Planned Parenthood kind of menu of uh, hormonal options for uh, turning off your fertility. So um, it's, it's a balance. And I, I think, you know, someone who I really respect, she's a writer, um, Lear Keith, you know, says, you know, she has a, uh, I'm going to paraphrase, but something along the lines of we are more than what they've made us out to be. And so choice, real choice is only possible once you start to understand that there's something kind of greater going on, call it a conspiracy, call it a strategy, uh, call it a, um, an agenda, a movement, whatever, however you want to look at it. Um, and so I think that's true in the realm of industrial birth, uh, hormonal birth control, and then also, um, within within trans ideology um and it's again there there are many systemic uh, kind of uh, you can kind of have that view on a number of issues whether we're talking about children where we're talking about men um but yeah that kind of zoom out zooming out analysis really helped me um to be able to stop kind of like feeling like i was a cog um and so also on a personal level, it was, again, I, I mentioned this earlier, but it, it, it did, yeah, it was ego boosting to feel like I knew something that other people didn't know, like that I could empathize with this small minority of uh, oppressed people called trans people, and that I had the language and that I was setting an example to my clients, even though none of them were trans identified that I would be the woman in their life to set the example of, of inclusivity. And I, I just want to share with you, uh, I, I really resonate with you, Isabella, it, uh, just out of my own lived experience. I got married really young and my wife was 19 uh, and I was 21 when we had our first, first child. And uh, we were part of the medical complex, went in there, doctor came in, uh, gave her an episiotomy and you know, pull the baby out with forceps and it was invasive. And mm -hmm. she was just a kid. She had no idea what was happening and just going with the program. And over time, <clears throat> uh, by the time she was 26, we had our fourth child and it had morphed into a, a home birth and it was an event. And we had like 20 people over uh, in, in, you know, just celebrating life and, you know, labored in the hot tub and then gave birth uh, uh, at home. And that was a, a beautiful family experience. Everybody shared in the birth and, six years ago, uh, my daughter gave birth to, a, uh, my, my first, uh, or my, my second granddaughter. And, uh, she invited me to be in the birthing room. Uh, and, uh, uh, she was living in Alberta at the time. And I actually watched my daughter. I was babysitting her to or watching the two older kids. And for a third child, she wanted me to be there. And I just cried like a little girl, uh, the, the incredible phenomenon of watching my daughter uh, bring forth life. It was absolutely beautiful. And, uh, and, and so I, I can resonate with this empowerment of, of females and avoiding the medical industrial complex and the things that you fight, fight for, because I lived it, I, you know, and I lived the, the, the beautiful benefit of that. It was a big room and I wasn't, you know, she had her privacy, but I was there and just the, the entire process was, transformative and just the appreciation of life and mm. the empowerment of women. It was just something beautiful. So I wanted to share that with you uh, mm. so you can understand maybe where I'm coming from too. That, that's really, that's awesome to have had that trajectory of, I think that's a lot of women's stories, you know, going from, you know, what you don't want to what you want. And I wish that wasn't the way I wish that everyone, every woman's first birth was ecstatic and autonomous and filled with love and support. And, um, yeah, I, I don't. It's not every day that I hear a woman inviting her father to <laughs> her, her birth. Uh, I'm more, you know, I think, I, again, if, if she felt safe enough to, to do that and support it and, and that's what she wanted, that's great. I think some women like to have people around. Some people, you know, some women like to have no one at all. Um, well, my two daughter-in-law said, Dad, no way in hell are you coming to my birth. <laughs> so Yeah, <they're> just <laughs> that clarity is really helpful. I, 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 love, I love a woman who's clear about 
uh, what she wants uh, for, for that <laughs> time. But yeah, that's, yeah, it is, it, there's no, there's no comparison. It's a completely, um, it's a completely different experience. I think for the whole family, it has ripple effects for the whole family. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's a really, it's a really scary place to give birth. A hospital I find is a very, very scary um, place to give birth, phys- physio- phys- like phys- in the physical sense and an emotional sense, psychological. And it does have repercussions on the partner, on the doula. Like I remember having just a lot of traumatizing experiences for which I sought therapy and um, all, all sorts of body work. And then when I started serving women outside the system, like I was high for like four days. You, you know, one of the things like you, you woke up and you realized that this is going taking me and your worldview and, and, and the, the whole process of birth in a different direction. And, and I think like you're, you were a very well intentioned person. You, you really wanted the best for, uh, for, for clients, you wanted the best for new mothers. Uh, but this kind of moved into wacko land a little bit. And so can you talk a little bit about like the unintended consequences and what this ideology actually does to the 99.99% of females that are giving birth that are comfortable in their bodies and how this diminishes and, and the unintended consequence, or maybe intended as you referred to an agenda and that could possibly be, but, uh, why, why you got to the point where, where this is ridiculous and I'm really going to focus on the biological reality and the emotional reality and, 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 and what's happened uh, as a result or what are the negative things that you felt and observed? The tr- trans ideology and this, this, the language of disembodiment and self-flagellation and these people have it worse than I do makes it difficult for a new mother to say like, I want this to be about me. Mm-hmm. I want this to be about my power and my creation and my bliss, you know, and, and, and even outside of the trans stuff, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of shame uh, and uh, women are, are kind of guilted when they talk about their incredible home birth experiences, you know, and they, they feel fear because, you know, a third of births in this country are, 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 you know, end in a, in a major abdominal surgery. And so I think women feel a lot of um, guilt or, or fear around saying that they were like lucky or like they had it good or, you know, and, and, and just because you have a vaginal birth doesn't mean you had a good birth. Um, but yeah, or weren't abused in your birth um, or didn't feel, you know, silenced or erased in, in your experience. So um, yeah, I think women really need to protect that time and so yeah the energy of self-flagellation and just all of the someone has it harder than me or i'm so lucky that i could breastfeed or i'm so lucky that you know i could give birth uninterrupted or you know whatever whatever it is um it does not support the the paradigm that i want to see for all women like in their first births especially having these transformative ecstatic experiences oh that's that's so powerful because an event that happens once twice maybe three or four times in a, in a woman's life and and you know there is inequality in this world and i think a lot of this marxist ideology wants to flatten everything where you can't even enjoy life or the successes you have in life oh because somebody else has it worse and and i understand that and let's fight for inequality and uh let's fight for giving everybody an opportunity but there there's no way around that there is inequality. And, and so uh, it's wonderful that you empower women and, and you look at the joy and, and helping them to fully embrace that moment and make it about them bringing forth life and, and their bodies are uh, perpetuating the human species and they're given this child and it's just a fantastic thing. And so this was in 2016, 17, 18, you have this ideology and now the last five years, you uh, you're quite vocal and you have some quite vocal guests who are concerned about some of the things happening in the world and in society. And uh, what, what are some of your concerns right now and how this ideology is affecting everything? And, uh, and like, what's your passion on a daily basis that gets you up in the morning ready to keep fighting and fighting on behalf of women? The direction that we're going is, you know, full blown AI um, women's wombs being harvested 
uh, you know, outside of their bodies. There, you know, there was a proposal uh, recently uh, by a researcher um, to use, quote, brain dead women as gestational surrogates. So meaning if women ha uh, have the, uh, you know, on your driver's license or your ID, you, you have marked that you are an organ donor by proxy, that would mean that you'd also be willing for, for you know, quote, science to use your womb to grow other people's babies. So wow. these are the things I worry about. It's not, it's not policy. It's not like legal yet, but it is a proposal actually by a female, I think she's a researcher or scientist. I can't remember, but I interviewed um, a woman named Jennifer Law who exposes third-party reproduction um, the, and the ethical concerns around that uh, on my channel recently. And she, she talked about this, this proposal. So I think those are the things that I, I worry about. I worry about um, children, children's instinct, um, being taken away from them, them, them not knowing who is safe statistically. You know, you think about you know, the way that I was raised is, you know, if you ever got lost, if, if everything ever went wrong, you know, you, you go to the nearest woman, you know, uh, you don't go to the nearest man. That's not because all men are bad. It's because statistically you will be safer going to a woman. Uh, same goes, I think about like the bathroom example too. You know, when I would be out in public with my dad and I had to go to the bathroom, he would never bring me into the men's restroom. He would always ask a woman, preferably with a child of her own, going into the, the, the women's restroom to uh, take me with her, right? Um, so there's an understanding, uh, especially if parents know this, that, um, and the cognitive dissonance is so strong, but I really do think even with all the indoctrination, parents still know that their children are safer with women, around women. Um, and I worry about the parents who are being groomed, um, who have bought into the lie that they, that their kid will kill themselves unless they medicalize them. Um, that is very disturbing. And that's a really scary place. And it's the same tactic that's used actually in, in hospitals uh, with birthing women, you know, to get mm -hmm. a woman to consent to anything you say that her baby might die. Yes. You know, if we don't buy into transhumanism and all these, then are we haters? Are we, you know, how, how is the left going to co-op this? Like it co-ops everything. Uh, uh, and there, I, I don't know. Do you feel like there's like an agenda of, of, of elites not to be too much of a conspiracist or like wh what, what is it that highly educated people just lose all reason, you know, uh, and it's all emotion driven and it's all, this controlled speech. It's absolutely bizarre. It's like a brand new vocabulary I've had to learn the last four or five years. I absolutely think there's an agenda. I mean, I think it, this is a top down takeover. Um, you know, Kay <laughs> Yang uh, speaks, she's a, a LGBT nonprofit whistleblower. She uh, used to be on the other side and she speaks uh, primarily to the, the way that the UN has been instrumental in implementing this ideology. Another woman by the name of Jennifer Billick is like the number one researcher around the money behind the transhumanist and transgender agenda. And she, she, yeah, she really goes straight to the top. She collects the receipts. So I absolutely think this is an, is a, an agenda um, with tentacles uh, uh, in, in many spheres, legal, educational, political, um, social, you know, it's, it's across the board. Um, and I, and I, I do think, there are certain demographics who are helping maintain, you know, as you said uh, earlier, but the, the allyship amongst, let's say, like white, middle, upper middle class, uh, upper class women, right? There is, there is definitely a theme there of, of um, maintaining that. But wherever, you know, wherever the dominant paradigm goes, women will go because women ultimately want safety or like an illusion of safety, a sense mm. of safety, you know. And, um, you know, I'm not sure if you're aware, I just actually read the source documents uh, two days ago, uh, the International Court of Justice, which is part and governed by the United Nations, issued guidance for all the nations of the world, lawgivers of what they their expectation is like policy for the United Nations. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and in that, it really puts a, a very high emphasis on not only transgenderism, but pedophilia, saying that uh, uh, 
uh, and prostitution, that prostitution laws should, should not be criminalizing prostitution uh, if there's consent and even if there's money trans, uh, transacted, that that should not be a crime anywhere in the world. Uh, furthermore, the age of consent is not 18, that if uh, uh, there should be non-discriminatory treatment and uh, if because uh, some minors are more mature, uh, that they could have sex with adults and they can make that decision. And pedophilia uh, should not be criminalized. This is United Nations documents released just a couple of weeks ago uh, it, that I read. And uh, you can find it online. This uh, breaking down of societal norms and, and children. And uh, I, know, I know you talk a lot about, uh, and I, I want to get to that. I don't know if you have any comment about, about what, I'm, what I'm saying, uh, this is objective. This is not even up for debate. This is United Nations document just released. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, uh, but I want to, I know you, that you uh, have a passion for the damage of pornography and prostitution. <clears throat> I don't know if you had any comment about that UN document or if you want to just talk about uh, sure. your, your passion uh, mm -hmm. and, the, and the effects and, mm -hmm. and what that does to a woman's soul and uh, mm -hmm. And how how dangerous and damaging it is. Yeah, well, I, I think it's great that you read the UN documents. I I haven't I haven't actually sat down and, and read all of it. I I but I do think it's important for people to like face and to see themselves. But I think from what I understand about the UN, it, it, it the the implementation has been going on for like decades. Like it's not uh, what we're seeing and what they're revealing to us now is just like the tip of the iceberg. Um, and there are so many people complicit unknowingly in what is going on um, at all levels. I think there, yeah, there's, you know, the foot soldiers um, to some degree. And I, I had that thought when we were out, when Ke Yang uh, 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 put on a, a really awesome kind of like speak out at the UN. And, um, and, I, and I was just watching the employees come in and out, just women, you know, I'm just like, it's it's wild. It's wild. Is that the let the women speak? Uh, yes. Where the, the radical trans community shut down females from speaking mm -hmm. at the United Nations and that no that was that was um, the 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 event that you're referring to where there was like a barricade and like 400 yes. trans rights activists coming. Yeah, that was um, part of that was the New York leg of Kelly J Keene's Let w Women Speak tour. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the, the, the event that I'm referring to is something that Kay Yang um, put on at the UN uh, where she invited me and, and other women to, to speak and give our kind of our, our public uh, record of, of dissent. Um, and, and she, her speech was specific to the, the UN implementation of how, how the UN has been implementing uh, gender, gender identity ideology on a global scale. Um, and, oh, and part of that document that I didn't mention also says that no countries or no no institution on the planet should have uh, any laws about uh, homosexual marriage or transgender marriage or anything like that, mm -hmm. which, I, which I understand the United States allows homosexual marriage, but uh, mm -hmm. some countries don't. They want to strip uh, national sovereignty from every country yeah. when it comes to uh, their ability to make the laws that... Uh, govern that particular society, which, mm -hmm. you know, we could debate whether the law is right or not, but uh, just this global takeover of the sovereignty of the 200 individual nations that they're trying to implement uh, makes me nervous. Yes. I, it also makes me nervous. And, and, you know, uh, yeah, the gay, gay marriage makes me nervous as well because I now see it as instrumental in normalizing third party reproduction not because I, I feel strongly that two men or two women shouldn't like live in, in love in, in a legal marriage capacity and have those whatever benefits, you know, one might find from legal marriage, um, which is just a contract with the state. Um, but yeah, I, I, it's more, I, I see it as laying the groundwork. All, all of the things that you described lay the groundwork for the exploitation of women and children. Yeah, maybe you can uh, go in a little bit about your views and your experience mm -hmm. and your passion about the effects of pornography as well as mm -hmm. prostitution uh, and the think the thought of mm -hmm. the, the lies we're being taught of empowering women, like what's really going on with 
that entire movement? Yeah. So there's been a huge push or, you know, to normalize um, prostitution as a form of labor, as a form of work, uh, to frame it as, uh, yeah. And, and, and with that, to focus the conversation around um, labor laws. Uh, the same goes for the pornography industry, you know, rather than questioning, like, is this actually good for humanity? Or uh, The conversation tends to be around more STI testing, more benefits to actors in the porn industry, um, more exposure, more uh, um, opportunities, branding, uh, book deals, you know, whatever, you know, really, really uh, emphasizing the, uh, the entrepreneurship um, component of, of this quote work. Um, and why is that bad for women? Why is that bad for women? Because what is normalized for one woman will be normalized for all women. So if, if we believe, and I'm going to give an example that Dr. Suzanne Forbes Berling brought up to me, which I thought was so potent. So let's take the example of prostitution. So if we want to believe, if you want, if, if one wants to convince us that prostitution, um, is is a form of work then if you take the most marginalized group of women women in a prison and you know what do prisons have they have labor they have labor where women are paid women are paid to do different kinds of labor in a prison system so if surrogacy is a a reasonable job for a woman to have if prostitution is a reasonable job to have then what is that like scaled what is that like? You know, what mm-hmm. happens when that's applied to women in prison? Um, do, do does your good liberal friend think that's okay to have women in prison um, be farmed? Should the prison have a brothel? I mean, it's it's beyond. Everybody knows that a woman, you know, a woman who has penetrated like twenty times a week or twenty times a day in every hole of her body by complete by complete strangers, that that is not comparable to a coal miner that is not comparable to a manual labor that is that uh, you know someone who does manual labor in construction or coal mining you know there is absolutely no comparison now does the coal miner face health risks absolutely absolutely but to compare it to the process and the abuse of being penetrated in that way and to risk your uh your fertility your internal organ, your psychological safety. I mean, uh, you know, one of the most potent critiques that I've ever read on on, on prostitution and surrogacy is is one by Kaisa Ekman, and she uh, wrote a book called uh, uh, "Being and Being Bought," and she talks about the process of psychologically what happens when you are pretending over and over to want something that you don't want because what is prostitution? When there is money present, you know, that is an explicit, uh, uh, you're explicitly saying, I don't want this. Because if you did want this, you wouldn't accept money for it. If you didn't, if, if you did want to have the sex with this man, there would be no monetary exchange. You wouldn't go to a bar and say like, hey, I really like you. I'm into you. Um, now pay me to have sex with you. Yes. I, I'd like to ask you, uh, uh, as uh, your your groups and the, the people that you you work with uh they're all very strong women and a lot of people you mentioned they're feminists and they're fighting for women's rights and women's dignity and the empowerment of females and you uh you have you self uh identify as a feminist <clears throat> can you uh uh comment on, on how you see the radical left and the smoke ideology and critical social justice, how it's co-opted the beautiful work that so many women have done before you Mm -hmm. and given their life to. And uh, what are some of the warning signs or problems or things that agitate you about this leftist ideology infiltrating and uh, co-opting the the, the needs of women? Well, yeah, they, they, they've totally, taken a feminist analysis and implied it, you know, applied it to the trans issue, you know, to the point where they're saying you are not a feminist unless you include men in your feminism. You are not a feminist. You don't care about women hmm. if you do not include all of all these other tangential issues in your issues. So, so merely trying to focus on prostitution. And I think women who have been like anti-prostitution, anti-porn for, for, for decades now um, have expressed to me like a, a frustration around this conversation constantly Mm. being about the trans stuff Um, because the trans stuff affects women, but the, 
the dominant narrative is that we have to, you know, focus on these, these men who want access to breast implants and, and our bathrooms and our sports and, and yada, yada. So, um, so I think, yeah, I, I, I still do use a feminist analysis and I, and I specify now that it is a radical feminist analysis and by radical, I don't mean extreme. By radical, I mean to the root. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, if you have a, a strong critique of pornography, prostitution, and surrogacy, um, and trans ideology, I'm sorry, but you have a radical feminist analysis. This is an analysis that has been formed by second wave feminists. In um, 2023, uh, radical feminism was different. 20 years ago, in this generation, just standing up for what you're referring to, that's radical. That is considered radical. Yeah, it is considered radical. Uh, sorry, it, it will, it, it's considered extreme if, if mm -hmm. you're coming from like a leftist perspective. Yeah. And then, uh, but but yeah, it's also just radical in its like in the etymology, you know, of the word is that it is it is to the root, like looking at our physiology and the unique uh, issues that we face, uh, sharing a female physiology. Um, so yeah, I, you know, I've, I, I have, I guess, softened, I have kind of been strategic in the way that I, I talk about feminism, or I've tried to be and, and I really find it helpful to because I've been in so many boxes before, I do find it helpful now to say that I, you know, hold a radical feminist analysis rather than say I am a radical feminist because right, right. Um, it's confusing, like it's actually not descriptive. And, and this is where we come back to like the power of describing um, what you mean and what you're saying, and how you define yourself. I think just going one step, you know, deeper and, and taking the time to describe. And so even the, the language shift around, I hold a radical feminist analysis and I have to credit my friend serendipity day who, who brought this to my attention, that language shift, you know, is, is vital. I think in, in disarming uh, people or, or for opening up a conversation, uh, kind of peaking, peaking curiosity in that sense. Have you ever heard of a, uh, an intellectual named James Lindsay who does new discourses? Have you? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I don't know if you heard, uh, I listened to his podcast just uh, that came out two days ago and it was interesting. And he talks about, and this is, goes right to the heart of, uh, of, of the feminist movement. Uh, he, it was entitled, I think it was feminist, uh, feminist, uh, uh, Gnosticism and his premise is, yeah, this whole wokeism is a Gnostic religion. You get this knowledge uh, just given to you against all reason, against debate. It's just like, you know, and uh, he puts it all in that camp of, camp of Gnosticism. And uh, he says his critique of feminism, and I don't want to misquote him so you can listen to the podcast uh, yourself, but he says the feminists open this door to this uh, trans uh, and uh, radical takeover and the pressures you're feeling and you're getting bludgeoned and you're getting the crap beat out of you and everything you're working for uh, because you guys, and I'm not saying you specifically, I'm saying the movement itself, you guys uh, uh, went down the slippery path of accepting uh, gender as a sociological construct versus a biologi bi biological rea reality. And when you started that slippery st slope of uh, going uh, that that gender is simply a social construct and it does you know it's all based on society and and the environment of the time, you opened it up. And I'm not be, I want, don't want you to feel attacked. I'm just telling you what his premise was. You opened it up, and he likened it to a bus uh, or, or a train. Well, we're going to take this train down the, to this stop, and we're going to get off here. This is as far as we're going to go with this. Uh, 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 sociological construct, but the trans activists are saying, Oh no, we're not getting off here. We're going to the next level. And you're, you're coming with, and, uh, and you're, you're getting the crap beat out of you and you're wanting to get off the train and, uh, the ideologues are not letting you. And I thought that was kind of an interesting take. I don't know if you had if, what your thoughts are yeah. about that premise. So, yeah, I would like to listen to that episode and I, I hear what he's saying and I, I, okay, I have a couple of responses to that. I think, um, I think the equality narrative, the narrative that we are totally equal in every way, that we are the same, that men can do anything women can do, women can do anything that men can do. I think that that is a dead end. That is um, and it comes back to like nature versus nurture. Like, do we believe that everything is socially informed? 
I would say no. I don't believe everything that 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 little boys and little girls do is socially informed. I think there are biological distinctions and levels of testosterone and estrogen that um, that that do that do show up, especially when you look at childhood development. Um, and again, not everyone will fit into the this kind of generalization of like boys are typically more active and louder and like right. you know want to climb trees and like punch and hit. Like there is. Again, there's a degree of, of, of women who are going to be more like that and men who are more, uh, um, you know, like uh, more timid uh, in that sense in, in childhood, uh, taking fewer risks. Um, so I think the equality narrative has definitely reached its uh, uh, point of support uh, for, for women. And, and Mary Harrington talks about this um, as well. She wrote a book called Feminism Against Progress that goes into all of this. Um, but what I reject is that feminists laid the groundwork for this. I don't believe feminists laid the groundwork for this. In fact, second waivers were, you know, especially women like Janice Raymond, who wrote a book called The Transsexual Empire, was warning the world that this was coming. Hmm. She was like, there are these men who pretend to be women. Think it through, everyone. Think it through. Again, with pornography. Well. Women are objectified, like women are being treated in this like perverse way and like think it through, think it through. So they were absolutely feminists, especially second wave feminists, feminists of the 60s and the 70s who were sounding the alarm bells saying this is not good. This is mm -hmm. not going in the right direction. Interesting. So, yeah, I reject I get really frustrated when I hear um, anyone, whether it's a woman or a man saying, where are the feminists? Where are they? Where are they? Yeah. You know, or they deserve it. That is something that I encounter all the time. They, we deserve it. We deserve it. We deserve what's happening. We were so, um, that we were so interested in our hairy armpits and our, um, <laughs> you know, pursuit of sports and, and we, we deserve it. And this is the result mm. when you try to be like a man. And I would say, I would just remind, you know, your audience and, and, and you know, that, that, this is a top-down takeover. Mm -hmm. Now, who is at risk for this insidious ideology? Who is at risk for medicalization? Um, that is a whole set of factors, you know, involved in that. But we have to remember that this is an industry. This is a top-down takeover. And who this ideology lands with, um, uh, yes, of course, there have to be receptors and certain risk factors there to, to, to have it take off certain groups, mm -hmm. you know, and again, um, yeah. And I think, you know, female socialization is strong. And so when you tell a group of women that there are, there's another group in need, in high need, um, we will help them. We will try to help them. Yes. And, um, I, and my apologies if I'm mis, uh, characterizing the feminist movement or and my apologies to Mr. Lindsay, if I'm mischaracterizing what he was saying, but there's something in what he's saying that's along the lines of, and so I just wanted to throw that out mm -hmm. to you. Uh, to get your perspective. And I really, really do appreciate that. And, uh, uh, but, but this top down takeover, by the way, is not just feminism. It's everything. It's churches. It's every institution. It's the mm -hmm. destruction of families. It's the destruction of our government. It's the destruction, you know, the takeover in our military. It's, uh, the, uh, the corporate America, social media. I mean, it's ubiquitous. It's, uh, it's a, it's a virus, uh, and there is an agenda and uh, like, like for instance, uh, when this woke ideology, this virus works in, it doesn't matter. It has one goal and that's to take over and to take over the institution, take over the movement, co-opt it, make it what it wants. And it doesn't matter because if it takes over, it wins and, and they, they're happy. Or if it destroys it and the whole thing dies and the group dies or the institution dies, it doesn't matter because the virus won anyway. And mm -hmm. so it's, it's, don't feel picked on like I'm picking on the feminist movement or anyone's pick, uh, doing that because what you're saying and you're articulating is absolutely true. It's a, it's a takeover and it's a, an attempt to take over of everything. And, uh, and so I think, you know, if it hasn't hit you yet, I'm sure every one of our listeners uh, and your listeners uh, have felt the, uh, the effects and the impact. And if not, your day is mm -hmm. coming. Mm -hmm. And so my question, my, I'm going to give you the last word, the last word of exhortation, uh, what can we do from your perspective to fight back and to speak truth to uh, nonsense or help people that are stuck in this demonic ideology mm -hmm. uh, uh, 
to 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 get clarity again and actually push us back. Uh, mm -hmm. What can we do? What can the average listener do? What do you think we should do? And uh, I want to give you the last word of exhortation and encouragement to uh, our listeners and, and possibly your listeners as well. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. I think we have to work really hard to stay human. Mm -hmm. I mean, they don't want us to stay human. Yeah. They really don't want us to stay human. So I think like as simple as getting outside. And they accuse us of being dehumanizing when they themselves are the ones. I mean, that's yeah. they, pro they project on us exactly what they're doing. Yes. Yeah. So I, I think like the, the, the most accessible free thing you can do at any time is just like be outside, get your feet on the ground, like mm -hmm. sit, really just sit and listen to that inner voice. There are so many voices. There are so many uh, suggestions, demands, propaganda. And so just being able to sit with yourself and recover your intuition in any way that you can um, without influence is, you know, is really important. Uh, I think if you're a parent um, getting ahead of this ideology, I mean, mm -hmm. no, no parent says, you know, Oh, I'm going to have kids and I'm going to have to worry about my kid being indoctrinated by this ideology, but you do have to worry now. It used to be drugs, alcohol, kidnapping, you know, whatever. And now it's, now we can add to those trans ideologies. So Mary Lou Singleton and I created a course called uh, Inoculating Our Children Against Trans Ideology. And this doesn't mean putting, you know, not, it doesn't mean telling your four-year-old that there are these scary people who want to like cut off their genitalia. This can look like, you know, saying things like, you know, in this house, we believe that sex is real. In this house, we love and appreciate our whole and intact bodies. In this house, uh, we value family time together away from screens, away from technology. In this house, we believe that, you know, that, that mom and dad know, you know, what's best for you, that, that, that we have your best interest, that, that staying together, living near one another is, is really important. You know, in the, it, fill in the blank. In this house, we believe, we follow this God, we follow this religion, whatever. But really instilling really strong values mm -hmm. in your children so that when they do go out into the world... Um, they, they're armed in that way. Um, I think every conversation counts. I think if you're a parent, start allying with other parents with concerns. Not everyone knows that they need to be concerned about this, which is really, really scary. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think anyone with a child who cares about children, who has nieces and nephews, who is a teacher, an educator, a therapist, needs to know what's going on. And um, so I think, yeah, every conversation counts. Uh, and this means taking some risks. You know, the other day I was at a gelato shop and I heard this woman critiquing third, uh, critiquing IVF, talking about the risks of IVF. And I just totally inserted myself into the conversation. Mind you, I was with, I was with my boyfriend. So if anything weird happened, you know, I like had, had a person there, I'd recommend going with a friend or your partner, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, whatever. But uh, this looks like taking some risks. Um, and getting canceled <laughs> and brutalized. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I did. I definitely wouldn't recommend confronting a trans-identified male like in a massage room where you're like naked, thinking you just signed up for a female masseuse. Uh, definitely wouldn't recommend the confrontation in that context. You know, so mm -hmm, definitely sure. make sure of your surroundings and that that you're safe um, in that way. And uh, yeah, you, you, if you have to be more strategic, like if you're thinking about leaving a job where you feel totally silenced and like can't speak your truth, you know, start using your free time to uh, apply for other jobs, start a side gig, move in with your parents. If you have to, anything you, you can do to uh, protect the well-being of your family, even if that means taking, uh, you know, making, you know, moving states, moving homes, moving, leaving your job. Um, this is what, this is what people have to do. This is what people are doing. Yes. Uh, to to maintain a sense of sanity and safety for their for their family. Well, Isabella, it's a, a real honor to me personally that, that you come on the, on the show. Uh, you're extremely busy. You have your hands in a lot of things. You have a, a wonderful program. It's called Whose Body Is It? Uh, people can get a hold of you through the YouTube channel or how can people uh, know more about you and communicate with you? So I'm very, very active on Instagram. I have a very loyal uh, like Instagram community. Um, you can find me on Instagram at whose body is it? I answer every Monday. I do a Q and a, so if you have a question uh, and you don't want to book a session or do one of my, my, my kind of paid offerings, you can find me on Mondays on Instagram answering lots of questions. 
Um, my website is whosebodyisit.com and my podcast is available on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, all podcast platforms. Okay, wonderful. Well, well, thank you so much and may God bless you and prosper you and give you clarity and, and great fruitfulness in, in your efforts. Thank you again. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate this conversation.